Hi again, YouTube. It's that one guy in lit class, here today to talk about a couple of different ways of telling a story. We're going to be focusing today on an excerpt of a book written by a guy named Eric Auerbach. I'll provide a link to the Amazon page for the book if anyone is interested in reading the entire thing after the video. Okay, so the text we're looking at today, and really all the texts we've looked at so far, are concerned with the question of mimesis. We've been dancing around this concept for a while now, but let's go ahead and define it. Mimesis is a representation or imitation of the real world in art or literature. So we've seen a couple examples of how people respond to acts of mimesis. Socrates sees them as something to be mistrustful of, whereas Gorgias looks on them as a creative force in the world. And Auerbach is now going to introduce us to two mimetic forms, the Homeric and the Elohistic. The Homeric form, as you may have already guessed, is inspired by the Greek poet Homer's two famous epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which tell the story of the Trojan War and Odysseus' subsequent journey home. Auerbach picks up the tale late in Book 19 of the Odyssey, as Odysseus has finally made it back to his home island of Ithaca, shown here on the map in red, and is greeted by his old housekeeper, Eurachlia, who recognizes him despite the fact that Odysseus is disguised because of a scar on Odysseus's leg. Odysseus both threatens and pleads with her not to reveal him to his wife quite yet, as he is still observing to make sure that she has been faithful to him and has not succumbed to the desires of one of her suitors. Except that this is not exactly how Homer tells it. In between Eurachlia's recognition of the scar and Odysseus's bargaining with her, there are about 80 lines worth of exposition where Homer describes exactly how Odysseus got the scar, who he was with, what he was doing, how long it took, and so forth. This, Auerbach argues, is the essence of Homeric style. It seeks to explain and account for everything that is part of the story, and is therefore given to long explanations of how this or that god came to be in such and such a place, and where he came from, and how he got from point A to point B, or which warriors had fallen to this or that hero, and when, and how. It is, in other words, a storytelling style of nothing but foreground, where every new character or object that is introduced becomes the sole focus of the narrator, even, as in this case, when the narrator is already in the middle of explaining something else. Auerbach compares this style to a different ancient style, that of the Elohist, a name given to the writer of a collection of texts that helped form the basis of both the Torah and the Old Testament. Auerbach moves now to the book of Genesis, chapter 22, when God commands Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. The entire chapter is 24 verses long, and the story itself takes up only 19 of those verses, so it should be pretty clear already that we're dealing with a much more succinct kind of storytelling here. But Auerbach argues that just because the story is shorter does not necessarily mean that its characters are less real. In fact, he goes so far as to argue that in some ways the brevity of the story heightens the suspense and allows a reader to more fully understand the emotional turmoil of the main characters, because unlike Homer, the Elohis does not offer explanations or descriptions beyond the bare minimum of what the characters in the tale are doing. So, for example, in verse 1 of chapter 22, God appears to Abraham and says, quote, Behold, here I am. I'm using the King James version of the Old Testament for this video, by the way. We don't know where God came from or what he was doing before this moment. In fact, we don't really even know where God is or how exactly Abraham is supposed to be beholding him. Is God above him, below him, beside him? The Elois is silent on these points. And surely in verse 9, Isaac must be wondering why exactly his father has just, quote, laid him on the altar upon the wood, but if so, the Elohist makes no mention of it. It is a text of uncertainty, and where characters' emotions and stories are not given to us by the narrator, it becomes our natural instinct as readers to supply these emotions and stories for ourselves, based on our own experiences. Reading this kind of story requires more work from the reader. He or she must be an active participant in order for the story to have any sort of coherence or emotional impact, and yet stories in this vein offer us a degree of freedom we do not have in Homer, where when Odysseus feels fear, we are immediately supplied with both a reason and an explanation for that reason. And this uncertainty allows the Elohist one additional literary feat that is largely lacking in Homer, character development. In Homeric epics, gods and heroes alike are of a type. Hera is jealous and vengeful, Achilles is proud and more than a little petty, Odysseus is crafty and determined, and by and large these types never change. Odysseus upon returning home is the same as he was when he left 20 years prior. Compare this to the development of biblical characters like Abraham or Moses or David, who rise from mixed circumstances to become leaders, though not without undergoing trials and tribulations, and their characters are shaped by the struggles that have occurred in their lives. At the end of chapter 22, for example, Abraham is promised by God that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars of heaven or the grains of sand on the seashore. But Abraham is not told how long this will take or what additional trials he and his offspring will endure. Both of these texts seek to create a kind of reality through storytelling, and to get back to mimesis, both of them seek to represent their world in some way. Both of them have elements of the supernatural, and both of them have characters that are considered heroes. In other words, both of these tales have largely the same ingredients, but get vastly different kinds of stories out of them. The point of this video is not to argue for or against one style or the other. 
The fact is, both styles have made a huge impact on Western literature, and if you look, you can find modern examples of both pretty readily. In Homer, we have an early example of an omniscient narrator, one who knows every character's motivations and then passes them along to the reader. In the Elohis, we have an example of a limited narrator, only passing along certain information and leaving the rest to speculation and doubt. Both of these kinds of narration are perfectly valid ways of constructing a story, and have seen extensive use in the millennia since. One final note before I end this video. So far we've talked exclusively about mimesis, the act of representing something. I'd like now to briefly introduce the concept of diegesis, which is the telling of something by a narrator. Diegesis specifically refers to the internal world of a story. If you think of a book as a closed box from which nothing can escape, diegesis is what governs the things that happen in that box, whereas mimesis is the act of creating the box. To put it another way, mimesis shows or does, whereas diegesis tells. Diegesis cannot exist outside of its medium, in the same way that a book's narrator cannot exist outside that book. Mimesis, on the other hand, is the act of creating a self-contained world, whether it be a book, a poem, a painting, or any other sort of representative art. In the next video, we'll be talking about canons. Thanks for watching. Cheers!